Hello, world singers. My name is Tyler. And my name is Brooke. And this is Cosmere Conversations. Hello, all you lovely podcasting friends out there in the cognitive realm that exists where our voices can just meet you wherever you happen to be in space and time. It is fantastic that you have returned for another episode because last week we talked all about magical crossovers in the Cosmere and what we think could exist in the future of the Cosmere. This week we're back with a sort of part two to that exploration, looking at fabrials and magical technology across the Cosmere. Every time we were speaking last episode, there was a possible tangent that we could go down where we would be discussing fabrials instead of the pure magic systems that we have come to know and love. Yeah, once you start throwing fabrials into the mix, it just completely changes the game. And we're going to use the word Fabriel in this episode in a generalized way, which Brandon has said basically any magical technology across the Cosmere can be called a Fabriel. So that's the way we're going to use the terminology. And we're going to go through several of the existing Fabrials across the Cosmere planets, as well as, of course, have some of that deep speculation about what could possibly exist in a crossover situation or what we think may exist or already does exist right now. Let's start with the fact that before the shattering, Adenalsium prevented Fabrials from existing, per word of Brandon. I think that makes a lot of sense because Fabrials, like we said, just unlock so much potential for power and power abuse, maybe? Yeah, power abuse, definitely. It's like hemallergy taken to a logical conclusion of just like a lot of abuse potentials and manipulation potentials. What I find interesting is that maybe the prevention of Fabrials by Adenalsium is actually what set the 16 vessels that would become shards plus hoid uh, Hmm. on their path of like hey we're scientists i don't know this is all yeah just like don't restrict the power exactly don't restrict the power to the man we know that you're doing something restrictive and we want to prevent you from doing that and so we're going to invent a fabrial that breaks at a nauseum yeah i think in like a more general way my sense is that that was the feeling behind the shattering of just like, why is there this one being with all the power mm-hmm. and like the ability to dictate restrictions and whatnot? Smash. That's exactly That's the sound what of they said. Adenalsium shattering. Just smash. Sma- like a Hulk smash, but softer, yeah, more gentle. Smash. smash. And so we had no Fabrials or investiture infused technology before Adenalsium. And then we have basically a bunch of different planets that are somewhere on the timeline of their invention and use of Fabrials. Let's start on Rashar, which is probably the first place we think of when we hear the word Fabrial. Home to the Artifabrians, as well as the mother of machines, Navani Kolin. Yes. There are a few different types, iterations yeah, we gotta of Fabrials yeah, on Rishar because it seems like the OG Fabrials were Spren Fabrials created by higher Spren manifesting as a quote unquote like machine. We see them as the ancient soul casters rather than as a shard blade in the physical realm. Yes, this was a important revelation in Rhythm of War that the old soul casters, the ancient soul casters, are akin to Spren locked as shard blades. They are just locked in a different form, and that form then allows for functionally any individual— but in Rasharian history, it's been heavily restricted to who can use those soul casters. Yes. But those 
soulcasters are the ones that also will transform the user yes. over a long period of time, which we see in one of the interludes uh, of the journey into Amia that then mm -hmm. Don Shard picks up on because like that yeah. journey was lost. They sent the soul caster and now it's gone. And so there's a whole bunch of potential and we do see this on screen. It's a key part of Rosharian and specifically the Voran Kingdom's way of living and like going to war all the time they need yeah. the soul casters to be producing the grain they're a big factor in the power that a country or a region is able to have because they do enable so much more military action because of their ability to produce food and shelter and all the things that you need basically yeah and so we should see that example of the Voran kingdoms and the way we hear about shard blades and shard plate being so important that, you know, the specific number of shards that you have in your kingdom is also a ranking system of how powerful you are. The same can be said about soul casters. I wonder if all of those calculations are going to start changing, though. Exactly. I do think they're going to yeah. change. Interestingly, the humans have been trying to reproduce mm -hmm. creating those ancient fabrials which is what we see primarily with Navani's inventions and all of the other Arden's inventions. I think the difference here is that the spread manifested fabrials are creating the metal tanavastium, right? Which is the same as the metal that shard blades and shard plate are made out of. And I think that's the only way you get Tanavastium, whereas the fabrials that they are creating, manufacturing, mm -hmm. have, you know, more mundane metals, not god metals. We would suspect that a lot of the investiture isn't reliant on spread in the same way. Yeah. Well, I think there's just sort of a different like mechanic happening because yeah. the OG fabrials are granting access to the surges without having a radiant bond. But the new Fabrials we see doing something similar, but not like directly tapping into the surge. It's more limited in the scope of what it's able to do. I guess because the Spren is like trapped. Well, I think that there is some aspect of corruption. Maybe we understand it as corruption now, but it won't be corruption in the future. But using these soul casters in a way corrupts you that the modern mm. fabrials don't seem That's to do. That's true. That's true. Pros and, and cons. Yeah. So I wonder if basically the OG soul casters are attempting to forge a bond but yeah. like a bond doesn't exist mm -hmm. and therefore it's just a, a corrupting kind of aspect and you slowly turn into yeah. the grain or i would the... say it's more of like corrosion, corrosion. rather than Ooh, corruption yes okay so that imbalance that may exist with the og fabrials is important i wonder to though if we went you know back in time to when these spren soul casters were maybe alive or like did have a radiant bond like would that be different like my question is was this perhaps a choice in the same way that lift is able to manifest windle as a shard fork instead of a shard oh, of blade course. yes you know if you had a radiant who was like i'm not really into fighting mm -hmm. i don't need a blade spren can you please you know manifest as a fabrial instead it seems like in that circumstance there would not be that same corrosion aspect certainly if it is a spren caster yeah like a spren blade i think that that is what we are learning with these different aspects maya being the key example of something that's like in between mm -hmm. but maybe what Maya is, is a better reflection of what the OG soul casters are. They're somehow mm. locked in an in-between place. Yeah. But if there was a pure radiant spren that also wanted to be in the shape of a soul caster, I don't think there's, there's any limitation we know of that would say that's not supposed mm -hmm. to happen. We are in a militaristic world following militaristic characters right. like Kaladin, but most of the radiance in terms of the 
orders of radiance were not heavily militaristic. There were a lot of leadership and political positions. There were a lot of scholars. So who's to say that a shard spear or a spren blade would be the most important yeah. version that the spren could take? I feel like this is one of the big mysteries that was just kind of introduced with Rhythm of War. Definitely. Now that we're sort of getting into the modern fabrials on Rashar, I want to point out a bit of sort of interesting terminology. I think this is also from Rhythm of War, but the artifabrians on Rashar call the full contraption of like gemstones and metal casings, etc. The full thing is called a machine, and they call just the gemstone with a spren inside a fabrial. I thought that was interesting. It sort of pinpoints this word fabrial as very specifically captured investiture. Okay. The gemstone and the spren that is investiture, that's the fabrial aspect. Yeah. And then everything else is a machine created with fabrials. I do wonder how much of this is the in-world art of fabrians versus Brandon trying yeah. to simplify for the fans. Yeah. Like, guys, we'll, we'll call this machine and we'll call this a fabrial. Not just simplifying, but globalizing. Yes. So I that think that's the important. yeah, the terminology of fabrial makes more sense across the cosmere. Cause like we'll get into in just a minute, like Scadrian Fabrials, you know, is a medallion of captured investiture. And there are still 100% complete possibilities and future possibilities of just machines being developed. Oh, Whereas, yeah. Like, just like don't mundane to... technology. <laughs> yes. And it, we, I have some questions, too, about are things that we currently see on Rashar machines or fabrials? Like, I think that mm. both are developing simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And there is this, you know, industrial revolution. But so much of it is happening with magic that we get distracted by the magical side. And I'm just curious about where that line is. And so I think it's good to remember that the development of traditional machines is corresponding with the development of fabrial machines. Yeah, I started thinking about this as I was preparing for this episode and just that question of like how much of the things that we've seen in the future of the Cosmere, some of the little excerpts we've gotten of like space age Cosmere, mm -hmm. how much of that is fabrial technology and how much of it is just mundane technology? When it comes to the modern fabrials on Rashar, we do know that they are unlike the OG soul casters because they use lower spren. Yeah, trapped, that's important. Yeah, trapped inside of the gemstone to fuel the fabrial. And that might have more to do with the more limited effect of the new fabrials where it's not tapping into like the full surge because it's using a more limited spren. And while we don't want to necessarily go into a deep dive on the exact number and different types of fabrials that exist, mm -hmm. there are these categories that the scholars and art of fabrians, and I think Navani specifically, makes mention of the attractor and repeller fabrials. Mm -hmm. And we know that they can manipulate those different aspects of the fabrial yeah. by manipulating the different metal throughout the machine. Yes. And there we have an entire episode about that in the epigraphs from Navani's lecture. So if you need a refresher on all of that, you can listen to that episode. Interesting to note that the effects of the metals are pretty much the same as the allomantic metals. So then I start to wonder, would these effects be even more intensified if we were using an invested metal from Scadrial in a Rashar and Fabrial, you know? That's an interesting question. I think that the metals on Scadrial are important and they are different than metals elsewhere in the Cosmere, but it's also not the metal specifically that is invested. Oh, no, but I mean... Like the medallions, for example. Okay, that's if, a different spot. Yeah. yeah, if a Scadrian were to use the metal as a 
mine mm-hmm. of some type, and then that metal were taken and used in a fabrial. Then I do think you would have different effects. Right? Yeah. Oh my 100%. gosh. I can't wait to see that. I don't know if we're going to, There's but our first it would bit of cool. deep speculation <laughs> is yeah, I think that you could have some type of metal mine created on Skadril that metal then be taken to Rashar, mm-hmm. built by an art of Fabrian. Used in a machine. Yes, and would have an amplified- It would have like or, wild or, effects, yeah, I feel like. Absolutely. I think that that type of question and that aspect is what separates our Radiant stories or even like the Awakeners, all of the like magic systems that are locked onto each of these planets and specific- this is where Fabrials step in and be like, no, now we can start mixing these things around. To that point, though, it does seem like of the magic systems, the metals are somewhat universal. Because I know you were saying the metals are not innately invested, but they do seem to have innate properties that are consistent Cosmere-wide. I think that that is the key point, is that they are consistent because they're metals. Like copper is copper, and so it is always going to have the same physical makeup across the Cosmere. Well, physical makeup, but also like power makeup, like we were just saying about the metals in Fabrials having similar effects to what they do allomantically, and the fact that aluminum has the same effect Cosmere-wide of being like investiture inert. Aluminum is an interesting one because I don't know if aluminum comes from anywhere other than Scadrail or if that is their main export off of Scadrail and how common aluminum is across the entire Cosmere. Other metals, you know, steel being the most obvious, clearly exist and were all developed on their individual planets. The question is about what Scadrian metals have innately is, I think, an important one. But I don't want to get too tied up in the weeds on that because I I don't think that there's a lot going on with a Scadrian metal in terms of its innate investiture. Sure. We can can table that. Let's instead focus on how the effects of using the metals can adjust or redirect some of the purposes of these fabrials. Yeah, we start to see the fabrial technology pick up steam in terms mm-hmm. of its development, in particular the revelation that they can use aluminum to add different functionality to the fabrials that they already have. We see that in Donchard. Definitely important for Risen specifically as it is shown that the simple lifting mechanism or the the fabrial to conjoin two items and then you can drop one side and the other conjoined side will raise. First shown, I believe, or at least speculated in Way of Kings Mm -hmm. and then definitely on show in Words of Radiance becomes far more personal when it's applied to Risen's wheelchair but without wheels hover chair hover chair yeah that's exactly right so they want to invent and do invent a hover chair for risen but the problem that was existing with those previous iterations that seemingly is solved and being experimented with risen is how to limit and redirect the energy so that for example risen doesn't go flying up 500 feet into the air uh, something drops off a ship into the depths that there's a limiting factor that it's like yeah. she gets locked in at a certain height wherever she happens well, to be think, comfortable i think it allows them to isolate planes of movement so that she can have one fabrial for up down yes and one fabrial for forward back for example because I think without the aluminum, however that single fabrial is moved, Risen would move. She would have much less control and specificity of movement. That kind of brings us to the point, though, that at least in that we've seen so far, Rishar and Fabrials seem to be more limited in their capabilities in terms of The fact that they are conjoined and they have very specific relationships. So the flying ships Mm -hmm. that Navani invents 
are limited in how high they can fly because they can only fly as high as a chasm is low. They have this whole contraption of like fabrials on chulls in chasms, this like big, really complex situation that has to exist just for them to float the ship. To float and to get that forward momentum, you need a conversation that is the span reads happening in between the ship and the people back at the chasms right and then they have to move the chulls in the correct way so that the ship can move and that is just like not sustainable it's not expandable so i'm curious to see how that is going to be addressed as fabrials continue to be developed because it seems like at least on Rashar, they have a little bit of a ceiling in terms of their development potential. They certainly right now are kind of locked into the very simple or basic machine right. timeline yeah. where it's just like you have a pulley and you can only lift as long as your rope is right. or, or as high as you set your pulley. Exactly. And so that limiting factor i feel is great for invention where you need to push past the known limitations the obvious limitations and develop mechanisms to circumvent your known limits i wonder if that's where other investiture systems might come into play on rishar where the thing that sort of allows them to advance more is going to be the introduction of something from a different planet. That could be it. I think that's a good guess. I believe it's probably going to come first in the form of an innovation or an innovation type of a renaissance where a bunch of these fabrials that are being developed independently for a single purpose are then combined. Think of like the iPhone bringing together a bunch of different technologies. It wasn't that it was the first camera or even the first camera in a phone ad nauseum about every aspect of an iPhone. It's the innovation and ability to put all of those things into one. So I think that racium will play a big part there as well because it conducts investiture. And so the ability to move the investiture more easily from one fabrial one machine to another could open up a lot more possibilities for them and we also see something in the form of the sibling and the tower that is them where there are multiple different fabrials all generating from the tower light yeah i'm wondering if you could have like a racium lightning rod as the storm father oh comes over it's pulling basically sure. all of the storm light from that region into mm-hmm. one single area and then you're collecting it and then can distribute that like mm. a big gigantic electrical grid yeah but out of storm light dang it seems like they would want to reverse engineer the tower that big fabrial but then does that damage the sibling are you like breaking apart their body well i think that you would and that's maybe what the sibling is afraid of yeah and why they've been so resistant to taking on a new bond and also hopefully what navani is able to push past and develop past is an understanding of what is going on with the fabrials that are the sibling's tower and applying that to the Rosharian people. But then also, is that fabrial only able to be so complex and multidimensional because it's one created from a spren, it's a physical manifestation of a spren like the OG ones, and two, because it's a physical manifestation of a big god spren? I think we should definitely look at it as the creme de la creme of what is possible with Fabrials. But I think if we look at the individual parts that we've been exposed to in the Siblings Tower, from the lift structure to the fields of agriculture that were Mm -hmm. possible high up in the mountains. Yeah, temperature control. Yeah, temperature control, exactly. And then you have communication lines spread out through Mm -hmm. the tower all of those things can be broken down if you can reverse engineer Mm -hmm. and pull them all apart then you could maybe put them back together in separate pieces hopefully with a lot more understanding when you have the sibling helping you out in that regard directly 
And when it comes to the mother of machines in Navani, she has shown off and developed a couple of fabrials of her own invention, or at least her team's invention, and kind of putting the what they are learning to the test and also making some more militaristic things. In Rhythm of War specifically, we see the pain reel glove that was first introduced to remove pain. Like you could oh, kind of yeah. take out uh, the pain of a bruise, but then turned around, that becomes a glove that you can induces flip it. pain. Yes, exactly. And Navani uses that to escape and to aid in her efforts in Rhythm of War. But there are additional Fabrial technologies as well that we see on display. She makes a like wristwatch for Dalinar, which is so funny. He's always talking about how he didn't used to be so aware of like exactly how much time and now he feels so much pressure to be certain places at certain times because he has this watch on his wrist all the time. And then we have two different types of remover or maybe a tractor fabrials on display. One is the dehumidifier, pulling water out of the air or attracting mm-hmm. the water in the air to the fabrial machine itself. That is used in multiple different settings. One is like a party event when it is removing uh, the water from a room, maybe an exposed room, but they're basically, you know, having a big party. And then another time in the field of battle where yeah. the archers are protected so their bowstrings don't get wet and it's basically removing all of the moisture from their bowstrings. And then uh, the ghost bloods have a de-smokeifier where they have a traditional fire burning, yeah. but then above that is a fabrial device that's removing all of the smoke from it's the room. It's basically the hood over your stove. Yeah, exactly. Just getting all of that stuff out. You mentioned the wristwatch, which definitely does seem to be a fabrial, but clocks existed on Rishar seemingly without a fabrial bond, I think or at least a have... very basic type. Yeah, I mean, I think they have like water clocks. And they that have water type of clocks. Thing, but I'm pretty sure that the actual clocks, like we would recognize them, are fabrials, and the advancement is that Navani has been able to make that clock fabrial small enough to fit on a wrist. Which was a huge development in our own world yeah. and seems to be a big one on Rashar as well. But just to give a timeline, Kaladin said when he was growing up, so right around the period before he and Tien went to war, his father was the only person with a clock in Hearthstone. Mm-hmm. And then by the time that Dalinar and Kaladin are going through the story, we have wristwatches, which is a much quicker development of that technology. And I would imagine that if you also have developed to go small, making it cheap and therefore widespread Mm -hmm. is currently ongoing. So if most of Rashar wasn't engaged in a massive civil war to the death, I think that the power of clocks would be spreading. I'm very interested on how clocks work, just in general. (laughs) Because there are a bunch of different ways that we keep time. You mentioned the water clocks, which I don't believe have any type of spren involvement. Right. And I would assume work the same way that water clocks here do. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I think they have like mundane clocks that are more widely available. I know. You keep saying mundane, but I find clocks to be fascinating. Never mundane. Okay. Well, this is now a clock podcast. Yeah, clock cast. But the ability of, for example, atomic clocks to work is based on the measurement of a cesium atom, I believe, and like how many rotations or flips of spin can be calculated in a minute, in an hour. My understanding is that that's how the Fabrial clocks work. They have a logic spread which pulses at a constant rate. Exactly. And so if they are measuring that as their method of time, they are, one, should have very, very accurate clocks, unless there's anything that can disrupt spren, which Like aluminum? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's my question, is like, how easy is it to manipulate things like time when your base is spren, which is kind of an amorphous type of measuring system? Yeah. Let's go on, though, because there's one society that seemingly had a 
whole continent, or at least part of a continent, that was created with fabrials. It wasn't created, but it was made livable. And of course, we are talking about Amia. We learned that the Amians used something like a fabrial. It may have been like a proto fabrial because it was a very long time ago in order to terraform Amia, making it habitable. And then the scouring of Amia happened because those devices were destroyed and the continent was not able to sustain life without them. I guess this is a big example of what I was just talking about. If you are basing everything on your, in the Amian's case, ability to terraform or hold back the storms, whatever, to make your land livable, and then that fabrial machine is broken or destroyed, your entire world falls apart. And the scouring wasn't a invading force or something like that where the land was pillaged or burned or salted as armies have throughout time. Instead, it was the failing of their own technology. Maybe that well, comes from I, yeah, I don't know if we know whether or not the devices were purposefully attacked. We don't know if they were purposefully attacked. I mean, it, that's what it sounds like to me in what we have heard about Amia and the scouring of Amia, that it was a aggressive or like vindictive thing that happened that people didn't like Amians and wanted to get rid of them and then found an easy way. Yeah. And I'm curious if it is because specifically of these proto fabrials that were clearly very powerful that they were then the target of aggression. For example, the people who came from Ashen landed on Shinovar. We know did that with some type of magical technology and their society on Ashen was at least somewhat technologically developed, did something cataclysmic and had to flee Ashen. What if they looked at the Amians and said, no, 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 you're getting too close to the Ashen-like power because oh. clearly they're channeling a bunch of magic and, and investiture through their fabrials to terraform. Terraforming is way beyond our capabilities now. And so they clearly have a lot of power that they are demonstrating. And what if it was a recognition of like, you're going down the path of darkness and we need to hmm. stop that ahead of time. That's an interesting idea. All speculation, total speculation, but I at least want to introduce this idea that with fabrials may not be all good. Uh, as they yeah. continue to develop, there is a risk inherent in these possibilities, which we hear reflected as the bondsmith unchained or the radiance unchanged mm -hmm. from their oaths, is that there needs to be some type of limiting power and maybe Fabrials circumvent different limiting powers. Let's move on to Scadriel where we also see some cool magical technology beginning to develop when our heroes from Elendel come into contact with the Southern Scadrians, who have et metal slash harmonium, which is powering their airships, and they have the medallion technology, and the world kind of opens up. It really does open up. It is a Introduction to these Southern Scadrians who have been slowly encouraged by a Thydekar, Kelsier, Lord Ruler over time to maybe push the limits on these medallion powers. Now, they're on their world, you know, refer to them as medallions, but we see them as different types of fabrials. And yeah, they're originally given this technology by. The Lord Ruler, I forget what they actually call him. I think it's like the Sovereign or something to basically save their lives mm -hmm. when the whole catacendra happens and the climate of the whole planet changes and they are suddenly freezing to death. That is why they get the medallions to keep them warm. And then they figure out a bunch of different ways to use that same technology. The medallion is functionally a metal mind that yes is then manipulated using nicrosil there is a specific way that they create the metal mines and we should talk about a little bit more terminology in 
unkeyed versus unsealed metal mines. Got it. This is a great distinction. Yeah. An unkeyed metal mine is one that is not attached to a specific identity, but it still requires the user of that metal mine to be a ferrucomist of that specific metal. Specifically in Bands of Mourning, Wayne is able to use a unkeyed gold metal mine, but Wax cannot because Wayne is a gold fairing and Wax, even though it's unkeyed, cannot use that metal mine. Right. So it's unkeyed in terms of who uses it, but as a user, you still have to have the spirit web that allows you to tap that metal mind. It is likely to be easier to create an unkeyed metal mine, but therefore less useful. Right. An unsealed metal mind is one that can be used by anyone regardless of their spiritual DNA. So it's completely open. Anyone can use it. And that is what the Southern Scadrians are able to produce with some type of special technology or process that the Sovereign has enlightened them to, which is why we see Marasi being able to use the medallions and even uh, Wax and Wayne being able to use the medallions in the airship. So many of the Southern Scadrian medallions are unsealed, and it is the unsealed metal mines that are most important when we're yeah, speculating. Yeah, that's the breakthrough. Exactly. When you can take an investiture source and have it not be connected to someone's spiritual DNA, all of a sudden you get the universality that makes technology so possible. It is not the big breakthroughs that are happening, you know, with a single individual in a lab mixing up some concoction and be like, Eureka, I did it. It is the availability to the widest number of people that gets the subtle and small innovations that are happening every single second that then leads to the biggest growth when you have like a whole community or whole world that are all able to mix and match and do what they want. And that's where unsealed metal mines would at least be possible. We don't know how quickly they will get. Plus, the addition of et metal or harmonium sort of stacks on top of that to allow additional abilities. Et metal is extremely reactive with water. So it's basically not able to be used either allomantically or hemallergically because you would just explode. Yeah, even if you the tried to water like, and moisture it. of your skin is dangerous. Yeah. If you like were to spit on it or anything like that, that's oh, yeah. easily enough to make it combust. So I think that that might be the like engine for their flying ships and stuff. It's doing a combustion type thing. So that is obviously a huge advantage. And then we see the et metal primer cubes used and it absorbs or reproduces and like mirrors the powers being used in its vicinity. So I think the combination of those primer cubes, the ability to have et metal in your technology, plus medallions that are able to store specific things and then distribute that power. Like, what a freaking powerful combo. Yes, it does seem like while Rashar is the current home of Fabrials, Scadrial has the most potential yeah. for Fabrial technology. I mean, just the difference in the flying ships on Scadrial mm -hmm. and the flying ships that we see on Rashar, the Risharan ones are so much more limited in what they can do versus the ones on Scadrial. They're so much more limited, and it took the combined resources of many different groups all working together in yeah. order to come up with this, whereas the flying machines were developed by the inferior people on Scadrial, the ones without access to all of the technology at Elendel and all of the resources yeah. there. They basically, you know, cobbled together a plane, whereas the blimp thing that the Rosharians developed was all of their possible work, all of their smartest people, huge choles and all of this stuff working left and right. And then the Scadrians are basically Tony Stark in a cave making the <laughs> Iron Man suit. And then 
the Rasharians can't uh, even recreate a basic one. I think that's right. But I think we also have to be careful of like our biases and perspective because we've spent so much time with the Elendelians. Of course. You know, we think of the Southern Scadrians as being in a cave, but I wonder if we went to the Southern Scadrian homeland, if it wouldn't be more like the Jetsons, you know, where you're like, oh, we thought they were cavemen, but actually they're incredibly technologically advanced and we are the cavemen. That's a good point. Always great to remember to check our biases and remember our biases. These medallions are important for a couple of other reasons because they are one of the few mechanisms that we see right now in the Cosmere that allows for invested powers to be transferred or moved from one person to the other. The other similar type of technology or fabrial that we have is the honor blades, which have you know, a bestowed ability as well. Right. You pick up the honor blade and you have the powers of that. To tap specific surges. Yeah. Yeah. And I think now this sort of brings into question my earlier statement that the medallions are unsealed metal mines. It might just be that they're unkeyed because what they do is they use Nicrasil, like you mentioned, to store the ability to use investiture which then allows whoever is wearing it like to be a Farukamist to tap the other metal. So it might be that they're just unkeyed, not unsealed. I wonder what the difference would be. I guess you would just only have to use one metal instead of two metals. Yeah, the double ring that exists yeah. in the medallions is what you're talking about. And the first ring is always Nicrasil mm -hmm. that we see. And that might just be their most basic version of a medallion. And they keep the good medallions for themselves, the ones that are unsealed. Oh, whereas like the unkeyed yeah. are their common medallions that mm -hmm. are everywhere and more universal. And maybe that was the first thing given to them, as you were saying, by mm -hmm. the sovereign Lord Ruler. But Nicrasil does seem to be the key component as it does transfer the ability to use an investiture. And that is something that can be maybe geared specifically across the Cosmere. Mm, like, could mm -hmm. Nicrasil allow you to use a awakened breath or, or just breaths on Nalthus? Yeah, that's what it seems to be. Like, theoretically, I think a medallion like this in some way could be used to give a person like all of the metallurgic powers or even other investiture powers like breath or surge binding, which is kind of wild. Oh, it's insanely wild. But I do think that all of the basics are in place right now. Yeah. And when it comes to how these things will be used in the future, we obviously are going to get the Lost Metal, the fourth book in Era 2 yeah. this fall. But I think that we should also look at the characters that are being introduced as fundamental to the future technologies on Scadrill. We've briefly talked about this theory of mine previously, but the basic idea is that in Era 2, we look back on the characters like Vin and Ellen, mm -hmm. and they are, you know, near godlike figures or figures of importance yeah. in history. And we should see the characters now going to be seen that way mm -hmm. by Era 3 and Era 4. Specifically, I think there will be a origin story of technological and industrial revolution that is built on the backs of the characters we have right now when it comes to mm. space travel and hmm. the ability to fly and like how the ability to fly will change Scadrial so much. I think that you have Wax with his weight and mass changing as well as his steel pushing for some propulsion, but more the mass manipulation. You have Marasi and Wayne who are the two time manipulators. That's really important when it comes to long-term space travel. You have the gold compounder in Miles 100 lives, obviously. But when you look at their powers as when you look at their powers as a collective, 
rather than the individual that they are attached to, it becomes clear that if you had each of these things and were able to metal mind your way into each of these things, you could accomplish a great deal more than any of these characters are able to do now. Yeah, I think that that's true in terms of recognition in like a meta way Mm -hmm. for us as readers to get a close perspective of these specific powers. I don't know if I think in world these specific people are going to be recognized as like technological innovators because they're not really doing a lot of technological innovation, but they are interacting with other people in the world sort of in the background who are innovating technologically. The Tesla sort of reference. Yes. And the inventor. Yes, the inventor. And uh, Renette even with mm-hmm. her gun bullet technological inventions so there are other people in the world who are starting to put like magic and technology together in interesting ways let's move on to some of the planets that we don't see as much uh fabrial usage so far like cell for a second i was like well seons obviously like seons are fabrials but Seons are not really fabrials. They're more like spren. And I don't know if you would count like the Seon inside of the box as a fabrial, maybe. It's sort of like a spren and a gemstone. <laughs> yeah. And you're referencing specifically the walkie talkie yeah. device. And I think that that is a fabrial, while the Seon itself is a spren. Mm hmm. As per word of Brandon, it is important to remember that there are seons on cell and there are also skays. Yes. And they are basically similar, but they have a different shard that they manifest from. Yeah, they're so- splinters of the different shards on cell. Seons are splinters of devotion and skays are splinters of dominion. So I guess it's kind of like a spren void spren situation. I'd say that's a pretty good comparison. And I would be interested if they are utilized in very different ways. Like, for example, maybe seons are more useful in one type of fabric mm-hmm. and skays are more useful in another. Or maybe they don't like to be dominated in yeah. that type of way and they just refuse to work in fabrials. Oh, that would be an interesting yeah. kind of split or difference. I also wonder if you could get seons or skays to manifest as god metals. So devotionium. There you go. Well done. <laughs> and dominionium. <laughs> That's the really fun one. That's an interesting question because of what we talked about previously about the OG soul casters and the way that they operate differently. And so could you could you get a god metal Sion Fabriel yeah. for some purpose? That's an interesting question. Yeah. So that's a thought that could be potentially in the future of Cell. And then, of course, if we fast forward on Cell, we get the Irie, who we see in Secret History, this group of people from Cell, from it seems like Elantris. Um, And they have a couple of interesting Fabrials. It's unclear if they actually originate on cell or if they are the result of having interactions with other planets already, because we know that there is and has been interplanetary exchanges. It's important to note that when Chris is speaking to Kelsier during Secret History, she says that the people of the Irie have been at this moving around the Cosmere for far longer than she and Nas have. Yeah, and because so, they are really old in yes. the time scale of the Cosmere. Well, Elantris is one of the earliest stories that we exactly. know of in the Cosmere. Yeah. Probably not earlier than everything that happened on Rashar, but way older than the books we have on yeah. Rashar. Yeah. And so they theoretically could have been doing this for hundreds or even thousands of years and have way more technology than we left off in Elantris because they also have the power of soul stamping as well as the Mm -hmm. ways that the Dakor monks utilize magic, you know, within their bodies and their bones. So I think that there are lots of 
potential Fabrils, I could definitely see, you know, a soul stamping plus Sion type mm-hmm. of device that is you're able to control exactly what outcome you want. If you have a really good soul stamper and they stamp the metal and it says, I am a device that does X, Y, Z, and then you fuel it with a Sion or maybe the Sion is needed as a connection still to devotion and dominion hmm. to like channel the mm-hmm. investiture, something like that. So it keeps the soul stamp reinfused. Yeah, I think the abilities of the Sion's are still in question because Very much so. as far as we've seen, they are basically slaves to the humans. And I wonder what their capabilities would be without that. Yeah, that's an interesting question. The Sion specifically as a splinter of devotion maybe are not slaves because they are they're so devoted, devoted to humans. to their masters. Yeah, any, the yeah, first that's a human thing that they're just like, I need to be devoted to you because I am of devotion. Whereas maybe that's why we don't see the skays as yeah. on display as much. To get back to the Irie, yeah, let's start sort of with something basic. They have what looks familiar to us. It's a large yellow gemstone with a golden metal enclosure of some kind. Kelsier says that it's about the size of a desk clock. And I immediately thought of you know, good old Rasharan Fabrials. It looks very classic to our trained Cosmere eyes. Yeah, the metal enclosure specifically. Right, with a gemstone. Like, we don't really see anything like that on Cell in the little bit that we see of Cell. But it reminded me of just a classic alerter Fabrial like we've seen on Rashar. It seems to be tuned to detect specifically Threnodites. That's what they're looking for in particular, and it doesn't alert them as to the presence of Kelsier. So that's interesting. We don't quite know if that is because it requires a certain type of programming, right? or if it is because Kelsier is no longer of the physical world and he's only a cognitive shadow. Well, they're looking for cognitive Threnodite, shadows, yeah. but yeah, the Threnodite shadows are cognitive shadows. So you would think if it was just trained to notice cognitive shadows, it would notice Kelsier. But it seems to be tuned maybe like to a specific identity as a Threnodite or something. Curious why they're specifically interested in the Threnodite shadows, but that's a conversation for a different time. They also, of course, have the primer ball. Yeah, the orb that Kelsier collects or steals from them. And that orb has the ability to give connection or to forge a capital C connection to a shard. It's basically a bondsmith in a sphere. (laughs) Kind of. I mean, it seems like as preservation slash fuzz is dying, his power is being coalesced into that ball, into that orb. Is it? I thought the ball was just allowing a connection to preservation so that when preservation died, they could take up the power because like we know preservation told Kelsier, you probably can't hold this power for very long because you're not very aligned with preservation. And Kelsier thinks to himself, how are these people who are not even Scadrian, clearly not connected to our shard, Mm -hmm. going to be connected enough to achieve their goal of uptaking the power fuzz clearly says it belongs to vin like this is not for you it is hers but i can't give it to her right now and he gives the order the command to kelsier to get the orb and power to vin so it is certainly some type of channeling mechanism And I don't think that the primer ball is like taking anything Mm -hmm. from Fuzz. Mm -hmm. I just believe that as Fuzz is going down, the primer ball is like powering Powering up. up. Yeah, it's basically Mm. like I'm sensing the thing that I was built for. (laughs) And what Kelsier does is he takes Nas's knife, which this is the significant moment of Nas's knife. And I'm wondering if Nas's knife will ever come back in. But Nas's knife to break the orb and then the power is like flowing, radiating out of the orb into Kelsier, giving him 
a vision of all of these different, you know, blue lines as if everything was metal. And then he like pulls all of those lines in by force. Mm. Not that it was given to him, but he basically takes it. Yeah. And is then holding that power until he can get it to Vin. And he transfers that to Vin's climactic moment in the Hero of Ages. Unclear how this orb is created. Is it a Cosmere-wide thing that the Irie were able to get their hands on? Did they invent it? Mm -hmm. My question, questions. Yeah, my question is the orb similarity to the King's Drop and other large oh, gems yeah. that are able to capture Ooh, the unmade. Good call. Is that what is going on here? And are shards able to be captured mm -hmm. in that mm -hmm. same way? Mm. It's not a, a capturing as far as we know. Right. Like Nergal is trapped inside of a king's drop. But the way that the orb is operating kind of feels like that, like it's a gemstone and is, if yeah. not capturing, then at least like allowing you to dip into directly the power of the shard yeah that's an interesting connection to make i like that we do see some technology that seems to originate on cell which is the sort of power system that the irie have set up to maintain their building their little yeah. fortress that they've got going on In kind order, of a mini tower right yeah in order for that building to not start to deteriorate in the cognitive realm like everything else does, they have this system of power being fed to the cognitive tower that seems to maybe be channeling the power of the door into the building to sustain it. And when Kelsier is like scaling the building, when he melts his hands into the building, that power source gives him a vision of Cell, of Elantris, possibly, mm -hmm. and also gives him connection to Cell, so much so that he is now able to understand the, the language. language. So that's a huge question mark that I have is, what are they using a similar type of orb device, but this time for devotion or dominion's power? Yeah, exactly. Is it a it's battery? Like forging they... a connection telling the building like you're in elantris yeah exactly and if you're in elantris then you have elantris powers and all, everything that works in elantris also works here mm -hmm. so is it something like a tunnel back to elantris or is it like the orb seems to be as a battery that can be moved mm. around because that provides I more i think it's more like a tunnel or like electricity lines mm -hmm. that are i think that's yeah going back to elantris and channeling that power into the cognitive realm into this tower i agree but obviously i want a battery for our future of the <laughs> of cosmere because yeah. batteries are great if you can just plug your fabriel into whatever magic orb you need for infinite tie directly into the shard of your choosing you know you could just have a, a tesla battery pack of every different shard just all 16 just on display and whatever time you need one you just plug it's right curious. in that we don't see any soul stamping specifically in these technologies because it seems like it would be easier to just use a soul, soul stamp and be like, now you think that you're in Elantris or, you know, now you think that you're connected to preservation. Like, I'm going to rewrite your history to think that you're Skadrian. And so we don't even need this orb because we just created the connection. So I'm I'm just curious as to why... We don't see that technology being used more. We do know that soul stamping is limited in its applications in that it literally needs to be like stamped every day if you're right. doing something you would, complex. Yeah. And so it's intensive. And we also see that clearly there is a difference in the Rose Empire and Elantris in their the way they treat magic, how apparent magic is for them. That could be large part because devotion and dominion are destroyed and like elantris is one of the only beacons left of what is completely possible and everyone else there's is like, also just not a lot of inter-country communication yeah and so that's what i'm thinking is that if 
the Rose Empire and Elantris are basically around the same time, and then the far future for them is these Iri people in the cognitive realm that the Rose Empire loses. Like all the clashes mm. of their past hmm. ends with the Elantrians being basically in charge. Or of- they're just still strangers, like the Elendelites and, and the, the Southern Scadrians. That's an interesting theory because all of this conversation about both magic crossovers and Fabrio crossover it relies on people not being strangers, like bumping yeah, into each other. For sure. And you would think that would happen on the planets before you they go out so. into the world. Like the Southern Scadrians and the Elendel Scadrians, I imagine, have to have some type of merging before they become the spacefaring era four Scadrians. Yeah. I think we get into interesting questions related to Sazed or Harmony's thoughts about how he created too cushy of a life mm-hmm. in Elendel and they haven't progressed technologically as much because their life has been so easy. Yeah. Perhaps what happens in Elantris is they have this renaissance of the Elantrians after mm-hmm. the Shayad, Riad, whichever one, and they invest all of their time and energy and efforts into their magic system. And they might go into the cognitive realm and get sort of sucked into the investiture exploration so much so that they don't actually explore their physical world. That's really interesting as a you know, path that is so clear before them, like Elantris equals power. So go right. exploring down that avenue. Yeah, they're like, okay, what well, we need what's to going do on now. In the world around you. A la like the Matrix or uh, Pendragon series kind of. as a callback to those where you just get so focused on the power that's directly in front of you that you miss out what's going on around you. Mm-hmm. Let's jump over to Nalthus where... Currently, as far as we know, there's not really any Fabrials. Nalthus is one of the most interesting worlds because it has a apparent investiture system that is universal to everyone in yeah, breaths. at least in a small way. We have characters like Vasher and Vivenna, Azure, who are continually part of the ongoing stories, but we don't see a lot of what's going on in Nalthus. And we left them in what, compared to our world, would be a rather medieval or even like an ancient world. I mean, their primary fighting force is still, you know, swords, spears, and plate metal technologies. I Uh, mean, that's true of Roshar too. That's true. But it also is counteracted by the desolations of Rashad that for thousands of years have like knocked their society back. Mm -hmm. Whereas like Nalthus doesn't, it seems to be a pretty happy place, especially, you know, the closer you are to Halindrin and the court of the gods. But none of that seems particularly technologically advanced. They seem kind of like, you know, a Roman era. We have cool aqueducts, but we don't have electricity. Exactly. (laughs) Totally. And I wonder if some of that is because the returned are forced into idleness, basically. They're not really using their minds and their power to think about how their power could be used because they have the most power. And endowment may be limiting the technological growth in a way that we saw with ad nauseum, but in a yeah, way because... that's more similar to what Harmony said about making things too comfortable or too easy for them. If everyone has a breath, then they're, they're they're a little bit healthier than everyone else in the Cosmere. Everyone is just a tiny bit better. I think it's kind of the opposite where she's made it too difficult because if everyone only has one breath and it's very difficult and morally questionable to obtain more breath, you can't really create that much. Like you only have your one breath and you don't really want to get rid of it in order to create something. And so you don't. You don't create any technology. Yeah. I mean, think about the God King who is said to, you know, have this store from Vasher of 50,000. And then actually think about that number compared to global populations. Yeah, exactly. And it's nothing. Like 10,000 people is not a lot of people. 
but also a lot of people. It's a lot of people, and it's difficult to go to every one of them and be like, please give me your breath yeah. and to convince them. That's the limiting exactly. factor. But then when you talk about what should be possible, it's, you know, there are many companies that have more than 10,000 workers. There or- is still a limitation, though, because even if a handful of people, let's say, all of the returned in the court of the gods did exactly that. They went around and they were like, hey, give me your breath, give me your breath, give me your breath, and just built up a store, you still only have globally like 20 people who have enough investiture to start creating something. Yes, it becomes hyper limited in terms of who can hold that power and then distribute yeah, it and back then it's out, just, which then does also that retards person... the growth. Exactly. Yeah. So they are not really set up for great technological growth. My but... thought was that perhaps in the way that Rasharans have leftover soul casters, leftover shard blades from previous times that they sort of use to jumpstart new technological innovations. Things like Khaled's phantoms, Mm -hmm. the ability to awaken stone, bones, or even something like Mm nightblood, the knowledge of how to awaken more inanimate things, that might be their path forward into creating fabrioles. That gets also at what we have previously speculated about this episode, similar to the soul stamping of an object, a fabriel, or even the way that OG soul casters as a spren soul caster had some type of choice in what they were doing or, or the abilities that they provided. I definitely think that Nalthinian soul casters could be in place that were awakened by breath. So they're not soul casters, but they mm. are, uh, you know, breath casters. And that if you had the ability to channel the required breaths into a machine and a fabril that was able then to continually operate on those breaths. That's what makes it different from something like Stormlight is that breaths don't seem to decay or burn off in the way that Stormlight does. Mm. So you might be able to set up a more long-term energy source Mm. that is recycling breaths over and over instead of, because as far as I know, the way that breath work is you can dump it into an object and it will just sit there forever. Yeah. And if you lose that object, you just lost your hundred breaths or whatever. Yeah. But then you can reclaim them. So if you put your breath into a machine and the machine is able to operate, can it just go forever? I wonder if you would still need some interaction with Scadriel though to like be able to put your breaths into a mind of some kind in order for it to work, you know? This is where we enter into the speculation (laughs) part of the podcast. Or, I mean, I guess if we just take Nightblood as an example, the ability to put breath into metal, maybe that would do something. To also give that metal a purpose, a goal, a sentience of some type, where you are changing a item from just the machine itself into something magical and more than just the machine. AI, basically. That's what yeah. I and some people are speculating about on the internet is that if you could have, let's say, all the breaths that endowment has ever given out to anyone, you just were able to get them all. Could you dump that into a computer and turn it into an artificial intelligence that is more capable or as capable as any being throughout the Cosmere. That seems like that would be too difficult if it took, I think it's 50,000 breaths for Nightblood to be created. And Nightblood is a very simple machine on the scale of computers. I just don't see how it would be possible to effectively create even something like a calculator with breath. I think that... There are lots of questions in a theory like that. However, a simple calculator or even a simple computer really is just a system of ones and zeros and yeses and nos, on and off switches. But they don't have that. They just have... Like... All they needed to do was develop the switch that, instead of taking electricity, takes breath. And you can control with the breath as part of your will and like your 
command that you are giving with that breath as you Mm -hmm. pass it on to operate in a certain way. And if it's just like operate these switches, then you have a computer. You have a very basic computer, but you also... Maybe. Yeah. I don't know. I just think... I think it's going to be hard for the Nalthians to develop effective fabrials without external intervention, which is maybe why the five scholars were doing so much Cosmere hopping. Yeah, let's bring (laughs) in... We need help. Let's bring in those other investitures because the five scholars are a great example. They've been jumping around a whole bunch, but seemingly have only brought kind of limited versions of technology back. If they start bringing fabrials, if they start bringing the... Scadrian medallions to Nalthus. That's when I think the Nalthinians go from a rather limited Mm -hmm. planet to one of the most important because they also have something that none of the other planets that we know of has, which is a shard completely isolated, protected, seemingly unaffected by the larger war of the shards and someone who's been doing it for the entire time. This is true. My question that I just thought of as you were talking, if you have instances where let's say a person has 100 breaths, they put it into a cloak, they leave it there, and then they die, that power, that breath is not being returned to endowment. And so endowment in some way is constantly becoming less Less and less powerful. Yes, which puts her at a very vulnerable place when we know that the Cosmere is about to get a little cray cray. That is true. Nalthus could be the site of a major shard loss. She's always weakening herself. Yeah, Yeah, like if you're going to attack a shard... Go for I would one. attack her. <laughs> Dark speculation, but I do think that that is important. What may be a workaround for that type of danger is basically how do we either unkey or unseal breaths? Yeah. And most importantly, how can we take advantage of compounding? We talked oh. a lot about compounding as a power hack in mm-hmm. our last episode, giving a ferrucumist about tenfold increase minimum on their fairing power of choice. But what if you can, using maybe Nicrosil, maybe a double medallion, Nicrosil with Nicrosil around it, <laughs> so you have the ability to become a ferrucumist of Nicrosil, which sole power is to store investiture. Mm-hmm. But you've maybe maybe you can double tap that in some way. So you can put in one breath hmm. and get more breath out of it and basically create, as user Tribmos on Reddit said, an investiture conversion engine. Hmm. I'm going to do it in old timey announcer voice. A wonderful product from Venture Industries lets you store investiture of any form into Nicrosil pellets for long term storage. Tap that energy and get it back tenfold. <gasps> wonderful. A joke, yes, but an ability that may exist, Nicrosil storage devices, Mm -hmm. and you have the Nicrosil serving like a battery, and you have people that are, you know, their job, dump investiture into those Nicrosil batteries. Then if you can move either the battery itself around or figure out a way to convert your investiture, so Skadrian investiture, into stormlight or vice versa you might be able to tap into investitures that are not of your choosing and therefore giving you more power in a world like nalthus where the power was limited yeah which is what i was saying earlier with the medallions however i think that there is a little bit of confusion in terms of does necrosil store like pure investiture Or is it only storing the spiritual DNA aspect that turns you into someone who can use investiture? If you store some kind of Scadrian investiture in it, you know, usually metal mines are storing like a specific thing. Mm -hmm. Like, what does that look like if you then take it off world? I don't know. There's a lot of questions there. I think 
Scadrial specifically is hard. Let's do the two that we know exist and someone has already figured out the Ooh. conversion, okay. which is Vasher. Vasher has figured out a way to convert Stormlight into the necessary breath for him to remain alive as a return. That's more like one-to-one -to, -one to me, though, because Stormlight is like pure investiture that is then used for specific things channeled through the spren bond but we also and know breath that is also more of like a generic pure investiture that can be used in a specific way so those like two pure things it seems to me are more compatible like blending two liquids together whereas the investiture on scadrial seems to be so specific and limited by the metals and the specific things that the metals are able to do that I question how that specificity would be generalized to be able to export. I agree. I think that Scadrial and Cell, as we talked about, probably also Taldane in a lot of ways, are more geographically limited. Mm -hmm. We know that Stormlight on Rashar can't be easily taken off planet, basically, as you try to Mm -hmm. move it away from Rishar, it drains faster and it burns off faster. We know that Vasher has at least arrived and Azure seemingly have arrived on Rishar with breaths that they then continually use. Mm -hmm. And that Vasher specifically has figured out some ability to convert. Is that because he's a returned? Is it a five scholar type of discovery that he made or is it innate in stormlight and breaths just being very close in yeah, the power source that's my sense i think that those are all good questions but i believe that vasher is the example that we can at least hold up and say conversion of some type is possible between mm -hmm. these two things and therefore if you can bring a Fabriel invented on Rashar, let's say just the dehumidifier to make it easy, mm -hmm. but a clock would be great too. Uh, but it, you bring the dehumidifier over to Nalthus. Do you have to have a Nicrosil stormlight battery, stormlight charged battery, or can mm. you use a breath conversion mechanism on? Nalthus that allows yeah. you to power the dehumidifier. Yeah, I think you would have to continue putting breaths into the dehumidifier, which would not work very well on Nalthus. You'd be like, great, now I have to like kill myself a tiny bit just to keep this clock working. Just to keep the clock working. That would be a real bummer. <laughs> You'd do it once and then be like, well, neighbor, please come over and power my clock because we each only have one breath. And so this clock is only alive for like two days. <laughs> That limitation on the investiture of Nalthus is clearly why the Ghostbloods and Thydekar are working so hard to figure out how to get Stormlight and maybe right. Spren off world. Like, obviously, if you can figure out how to export something like a Stormlight battery, a gemstone that can hold Stormlight for a long period of time, like those perfect gemstones, mm -hmm. then... Yeah, you got a cash cow there because places like Nalthus are going to be like, oh, thank God, this is so much easier than having to corral every neighbor <laughs> on my block to like do something very simple. Yes, or funneling everything into the god figures. Right. And that to me is why Nalthus is one of the more interesting worlds and why we are constantly clamoring for the sequel to Warbreaker. <sighs> yeah. But also why I think Brandon is pushing it off is because once some of these elements are introduced, a new power source, a non-breath power source, or maybe a way of amplifying a single breath, figuring well, out redundant machines all of these different options that we've talked about once they figure that out then it becomes like a off to the races cold war type of situation where everyone is kind of competing as quickly as possible and we there see that there may be some pieces of the nalthian puzzle missing as well we've heard that in the warbreaker sequel they're going to meet up with another one of the five scholars who there's like rumors that he has some awakening knowledge that hasn't been public knowledge before. So it could be that in that book, they go 
and they learn a bunch of new stuff that's going to kind of crack open the Nalthian magic system in ways that we currently don't know of. Like the i alcohol as a source of kind of uh, magical mojo. Uh, but to just yeah. to keep that magic rolling, they use the i alcohol and a more potent version of that. When it comes to building all of these machines, we're talking a lot about power sources, but there are additionally things like a oil used for lubrication in a machine. Yeah. And if you had something like i alcohol, a theorizing, but like a perfect lubricant that could keep your gears in a frictionless or near frictionless environment that then could maybe allow Nalthus to become the mundane technology powerhouse. Like the yeah. best technologists could be on Nalthus. A power source mm. could come from Rashar mm. and the Nicrasil or the metal mines could come from Scadrial. I think Nalthus is going to be darker, honestly. I think their quote unquote machines are going to be innovations in lifeless technology. So they're just going to keep innovating on like how to mobilize dead bodies and give them powers and like use human bones inside of stone and yeah, things yeah. like I mean, that. You, you do that for a while, but then eventually you invent a robot. Like there's yeah, no Yeah, exactly. You, they'll they'll get to uh robotics at a certain point. They're not just going to keep, you know, zombies going yeah. around. Yeah. I mean, zombie army, that's pretty powerful. Zombie army. Zombie very army powerful. in stone that can like not be destroyed, very powerful unless they're fighting Rasharans who have shard blades and will just slice right through stone. Slice, slice, slice. Uh, more difficult if there's a bunch of drones flying around and just <laughs> dropping bombs on people. There's a lot of great speculation about what happens in the far future of the Cosmere. We have had a couple of episodes on that. And specifically, if you want more of this, I suggest our mini episode on the Six of the Dusk sequel, where we talked a lot about the Scadrians and Rasharian spacefaring people, but I want to go through a couple of possible bits of far future technology that would rely on some of these fabrils we have talked about today. In that Six of the Dust sequel, there are several different technologies that the ones above are using, including things like a investiture detector or maybe alerter. Something like that. And when it comes to how they move around the actual physical space in between the planets. We have talked about maybe a time dilation or a combination of all of our Era 2 individuals helping to fuel a space race, but there is another fictional series, the Mass Effect series, that may have an answer to this problem. In that series, there is an ancient technology left by a spacefaring race that is called the Mass Effect Relay, and it eliminates a ship's mass and then allows you to be flung across the universe like a bolt of light. And so it kind of eliminates all your mass and throws you out like a beam of light to another relay where then your mass is recreated and you've just jumped. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of how they use the medallions for the Southern Skadrians. They store mass in the medallions to allow the ship to get lift exactly to alleviate the weight i think if this was taken to an extreme you could theoretically have something like a mass effect relay your ship goes up into a, an orbiting type of space station your weight is nullified down to nothing you become completely weightless maybe throw on some uh, speed boosters or some frictionless things uh, and then boom you get flung across the cosmere and then there's this question of like what becomes valuable in a far future with all of these crossovers with fabrials with batteries mm -hmm. with nicrasil what then remains as something that is valuable yeah i think if we stay on first of the sun the AVR are one of the things that is unique and may become like a, a luxury item mm, in the gotcha, yeah. in the Cosmere marketplace because they are unique and unable to be replicated anywhere else, at least so far as we've seen. And we speculated a little bit last time about the ability to 
cultivate the bacteria on other planets and like potentially create other types of AVR. But at least for what we've seen so far, they seem to be highly sought after. And maybe that is due to their uniqueness. Let us know what your favorite Fabriel is and what is your best speculation for future Fabrials in the Cosmere. Definitely. Hit us up with those. And until next time, life before death, strength before weakness, journey before destination. 